This is a smartphone. Me and around 2 billion people in the world today own at least one. As you're using it daily, it's easy to forget the mountain of human knowledge that was accumulated throughout history that made something like this possible in the first place. This mountain of knowledge, you might be inclined to think, is something that will keep growing faster, larger, more massive at an exponential rate. But it seems there is a problem with that. There seems to be a predictable pattern in the way we've been inventing and discovering things over time. With each new invention and discovery, further newer inventions and discoveries are becoming harder and harder to come up with. To the point where today, as much as you think of it as a golden age of technology, it doesn't seem to be the case. Technological progress is not speeding up, it is slowing down. To explain this pattern, imagine that human innovation, past, present, and future, is a spaceship. We are outside the spaceship observing it, not in the spaceship itself. I am not here to discuss relativity. I do have other videos on that subject. With that said, imagine that we are trying to increase the velocity of this spaceship by accelerating it. Initially, it doesn't take that much energy to do that. However, as we approach a limit, you know it as the speed of light, the amount of increase in velocity becomes less and less and less for each unit of energy. This spaceship never actually reaches this limit, the speed of light. In this case, technological progress seems to follow a similar pattern, except the limit here is not the speed of light, but is another kind of limit. In this paper, Jonathan Hubner discusses this idea. He mentions two types of limits. The first limit, the ultimate limit on human innovation, is called the physical limit. For example, you can try to build a perpetual motion machine, but you can't really do that because that violates the laws of physics. So the physical limit is the ultimate limit. However, the more likely limit that has limited human innovation throughout history is not the physical limit, but the economic limit. For example, you can try to build a bridge that spans the entire equator, but you really can't do that because no amount of money in the world today is going to allow you to build such a humongous structure. What we will be discussing is not the physical limit, but the economic limit, because the physical limit is much, much harder to reach than the economic limit. In order to understand what is going on, what I needed to do is to make a list of all important inventions and discoveries throughout human history. Not small, tiny iterations like, say, the difference between the iPhone 6 and the iPhone 7. No, important technologies that completely changed the way human society functions, say like stone tools, fire, surgery, gunpowder, the law of universal gravitation, genetic engineering, and so on and so forth. Fortunately for you, you don't actually have to make that list because this list already exists. So sorry if you've already started working on it. In fact, the paper that I mentioned earlier already uses that list as part of its analysis. The analysis includes around 7,200 important innovations and discoveries throughout history since the Dark Ages. And the analysis includes dividing the number of events each year by the total number of humans that existed in that particular year. And if you do that, you're going to find that human innovation throughout time looked like this. This means that our innovation has peaked around the 19th century and has started to slow down ever since. Now, if you are still skeptical about the fact that technological progress is becoming harder and more costly over time, there was another study that was conducted later on, the results of which seem to be consistent with what John had found in his own study. In particular, they used data from the United States Patent and Trademark Office for their analysis. It's worth noting that patents registered at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, 50% of which are foreign patents. So this data is not only a good indicator for the United States trend in terms of innovation, but worldwide as well. Using this data, they constructed a database that covers a period between 1970 and 2005. Their analysis has shown that the average research and patenting team across all sectors has increased by around half. And the number of patents for each inventor, it's a number that's been going down. 
in his paper based on his analysis don attempts to make a series of predictions about how close we are to this innovation limit remember the spaceship example earlier and how this spaceship represents the rate of human innovation over time how it is difficult to push the spaceship as it approaches the limit in this case the innovation limit will john predicted in 2005 that we have reached 85 percent of this limit a velocity of 85 percent if you imagine it to be the speed of light in 2018 this velocity is expected to increase to around 90 percent and by the year 2038 we would have reached an innovation velocity of around 95 percent if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. It doesn't matter who said it, whether it's Newton or someone else. What matters is what it means. What it means is that current inventions and discoveries are possible due to the inventions and discoveries of those that have preceded us. And this seems to be the main problem that is causing an innovation decline. With each new invention and discovery, complexity increases more and more and more. And as a result, you would need more time, effort, and resources to come up with even newer inventions and discoveries. And this becomes worse and worse and worse. When you were very young, you probably studied some very basic concepts about the world. And as you progressed in your studies, you had to learn more and more complex topics. Eventually, by the time you reach high school in certain countries or college in other countries, you have had to specialize your knowledge. And as you progressed even more, you had to specialize even more and more and more. The main driver behind this specialization trend seems to be the increasing amount of knowledge that we have available and the increasing amount of complexity of this knowledge. As a result, if you want to come up with something new, you need a team of experts that are specialized in different areas within the field. But because knowledge is becoming more and more complex as time passes, this means you would need a larger and larger pool of specialized knowledge. Therefore, you need more resources, time, energy, and effort to come up with something new. As we start thinking of solutions to things like climate change or putting a man on Mars or even putting a man on the recently discovered potentially habitable planet in the Proxima Centauri system, it's important to understand how far technology can carry us, especially in light of the fact that inventing and discovering newer things is becoming harder and more costly with time. The thing is, we are not without choices here. One of the choices that we have is to start tackling the challenges that we are facing today with technologies that exist, you guessed it, today, not in the future. For example, nuclear fusion technology is one of those technologies that could completely change the way our economy and society work. How? It basically allows us to bring the way the sun produces energy, the fusion of atoms together. Mass is lost during this fusion process in the form of energy, you know, E equals mc squared, and then we can use some of that energy for whatever purpose we desire. Nuclear fusion technology could completely cut our dependence on non-renewable energy sources like fossil fuels, which are a primary reason for why the climate is changing in the first place. Nuclear fusion technology could provide us with sustainable, clean, renewable energy for millions of years. Here is a problem. One of the most promising nuclear fusion technology projects is called ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. It's designed to test whether it is feasible to get more energy out of a nuclear fusion process than the amount of energy needed to initiate this nuclear fusion process. This project is not expected to reach first plasma, basically start working until the year 2025. And even if that happens, it's going to take at least a few decades to make this technology commercially viable. And it might take even longer, more than a century, to mobilize this technology on a global scale. Can we really wait that long? Some countries are not, and they have already started using technologies that exist today, right this very moment, in order to generate clean, renewable, sustainable forms of energy, which also allows them to reduce their dependence on non-renewable forms of energy, fossil fuels, which are a primary reason for why the climate is changing. Do we really want to wait for technologies like nuclear fusion to save us from the effects of climate change? Could we really wait a century for that to happen? If we wait that long, our climate may have changed beyond repair. And if that happens, it's not only technology that is going to become more expensive, everything else is going to become 
more expensive. Another choice that we have is to innovate the way we innovate. Basically find a more efficient way of discovering and inventing newer things. Maybe let someone else do the innovation for us. Say like artificial intelligence, strong artificial intelligence, which is able to achieve a state of recursive self-improvement. It might actually be able to reach the physical limits of innovation, something which we are nowhere close to. However, that is a very risky choice, and you know the reasons why. What do you think? What could we do to tackle the challenges that we are facing today, especially in light of the fact that technological progress seems to be becoming more costly and expensive over time? Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.